Good thing I got long legs, right? Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's better. Is that better? Where's, where's Jilda? <laughs> no, nobody above five foot nine will be doing this anymore, right? <laughs> All right. All right. Let us pray. Dear Father God, thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day. Thank you, Father, for everyone who's in attendance today. We thank you so much for Gary and Rhonda and his family for just being such a blessing to the congregation, to the church. We ask, Father God, that you would open up our hearts and our minds, help us to take this message to heart and to, uh, and to use it to continue the message of spreading God's love and all that Jesus has done for all of us. And we ask that you speak through Gary and bless him, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Mike. Big guy. So before that prayer, I was supposed to say, Children's Church is in the back. Uh, for any of our children like to go back, you can go back there right now. I think all of them already knew and already went back. So uh, that, that's a good thing. We're going to have a video here in a minute. Uh, as you know, or as our members know, coming up the end of February and the beginning of March, we're going to start a 31-week series uh, called The Story. The story. And uh, as we're, we're looking forward to that, we have a couple of things, um, actually three things back there in the four years. You come in, uh, simple ways to share the good news. One of them, the first one is mail a postcard uh, to current residents. So you don't want to tell your neighbor about it because you're embarrassed. Because you're embarrassed about your preacher or something. So you don't want to know that you invited them to church. So uh, you, we, we, you want to send a postcard. We have the postcards for you. You got to put a stamp on it but you can, and an address. But we have the postcards back here in the back, like 500 of these. So take some of these and mail them to people. It's okay to do that. There's other things on here on the simple ways to share the good news. The, and, and, and this is also simple ways to share the good news. That's back there in the foyer. This little flyer here called The Story is back there. The postcards are back there. You got these spiffy signs now that we ordered. What more could you want? Amen. <laughs> so the 26th of February is an introductory lesson that we will have on the story where you'll get your books and, uh, and all the, the, the book called The Story. And uh, then the following week, March 5th or 6th, 5th? March 5th. Thank you, Lynn. Lynn is the head honcho on the story. Uh, March 5th uh, will be our first official lesson regarding the story. So, with that being said, David, do you have a video we can watch?
excited about this. Um, the, the Bible, oftentimes, people don't know. How does it all just tie together? This will be a uh, series of lessons, <clears throat> excuse me, on tying and putting the Bible together. And I think you're going to really, really enjoy this. Um, and, and the, the, you know, just the lessons... The, um, we're gonna, some of our home uh, groups will be using uh, this as well, the curriculum for that, our, but our sermon series, along with our Bible classes, as well as the children's Bible classes, will all be coming together with the story. So if you are not excited about this, then shame on you. Uh, get excited about this. This is uh, really neat, and more to come uh, as, we're, as we're leading up to this. So, once again, thanks, church, for being here today. We're glad to have you in attendance. And um, today, um, I, I wanted us to look, look at something a little bit different today, I guess. Um, you know, as we study, and we do study God's story really every week in some way, form, or fashion, and as we study the books of the Bible, as we read and whatever kind of reading that you do, I, and we put it like this, you, I, I have a lot of different Bibles that I use, and it depends on what kind of reading I'm doing. If I'm doing more deep theological study, I'll use a certain Bible or cer several certain Bibles, whereas if I'm doing light reading of the Bible, I might read the message. Uh, which is more of a commentary, I think, maybe than a translation. But um, whatever you use as you read, as you, as you, as you grow, uh, we look at different books of the Bible, different passages for different reasons. If you're going through a tough time in your life or if, uh, a happy time or you're getting ready for a wedding or a funeral, whatever, there's certain places that you go, typically. And you'll find verses that will help you through that time. Does anyone agree with me on that? All of y'all are so stoic right now. Yes, we typically do that. So today, I want us to look at a book that, well, I believe that the book of James is the most practical book in the Bible. Just practical. In fact, I think it is, it is the owner's manual for the Christian. In every verse of this book, it speaks powerfully to everyday living, the, the, the nuts and the bolts of everyday living. It's just very practical. It's, it's, it's a pretty easy book to read. There's not any ancient Hebrew names in there that you're trying to pronounce. None that I can remember anyway right off the top of my head. It's just practical teaching, practical learning right here. Um, and, and, and it's just as practical today as it was when it was written to the readers back then in the, in the ancient Near East. Just practical Everyday life uh, lessons, really. So many of our New Testament books deal with deeper theological themes, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Don't walk out of here saying, well, preacher says we shouldn't be studying theological things. I'm not saying that. But there's a lot of other books that, that, that they just, they're, they're a lot deeper, a deeper study, much deeper than what James is. You know, as an example, you study the book of Romans, and it lays out the, the, the themes of justification and sanctification and redemption, and all those are great things, wonderful things. I thank God for every word that is written in our Bible. But some days, some days, oh, some days I'm not thinking so much about justification, sanctification, redemption. I'm thinking, Lord, help me get through this day, because I don't want to go to jail. 
Lord, I want you to be pleased with me today. When this day is done, Lord, help me. And so I oftentimes turn to the book of James. And throughout this book, James is endeavoring to help Christians to mature in their faith. In fact, and I say the word mature, and I've mentioned this before, and a lot of you are, mentioned, are familiar with Warren Wiersbe, who wrote a lot of commentaries, but he's got his B books, B-E, B, where Romans might be B this, or you know, uh, Luke is B this, B that, whatever. You can actually look them up, and uh, you, can, you can get those. Um, and I have, uh, you know, a couple of B books myself. One of those, in, you know, I don't have them all, but, uh, you know, if you ever think of something getting for your preacher at Christmas time, they have them on Amazon. But anyway, <laughs> I'm just kidding. The one that Warren Wearsby wrote for James is called Be Mature. Be Mature. That is what this book is talking about, maturity in Jesus Christ. Um, most scholars believe that the author of this book is James, naturally, right? The brother of Jesus. One of the sons of Joseph and Mary. Huh. But it's interesting about James because, well, he wasn't always a believer, was he? For even his own brothers did not believe in him. John 7, 5. So there's James writing this book, Practical Christian Living, but yet at one time he didn't believe in him. And in fact, it wasn't until his crucifixion and his resurrection that he actually became a believer and, and, and became a godly leader in, in the early church there. When James writes about joy and suffering and how to love and how to treat people, how to control your tongue, how to resist the devil and draw near to God, how to have a prayerful life, all of these themes right here, no doubt he saw Jesus live in these things. He saw Jesus not only in his public life, he saw him in his private life. And I'd be willing to tell you that Jesus was the same, public or private, wherever he was, he was the same. James was right there seeing it in living color. So when James writes uh, in very practical terms about how we should live our lives, I think we should listen. Yeah, because his big brother, that was God. Lived right there with him, raised up. Imagine that. And then he goes on to write practical things about living. Now, James is kind of a to-the-point type of writer. L -l Listen here as he begins this letter. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the, tr uh, that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So unlike some of the other writers of books, James dispenses with the niceties and all, and he gets right down to what really matters. Yeah, he doesn't spend a whole lot of time <laughs> saying other things, greet this person or greet that person or whatever. And not that those are wrong. I'm not beating up on the Apostle Paul. <laughs> he just gets right down to it. Hey, James, I'm a servant of God, Lord Jesus, uh, to the 12 tribes. And you know what? Let's get right to the point. And he starts off, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, how would you like to get a letter like that? Hey, this is a letter from me. Hey, you got problems? Well, <laughs> be happy. Okay. That's an interesting way to start. Um, 
How could I be happy? You don't know my situation. And I think the key phrase there is, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. I think there's four, at least four facts of life we de- that we definitely need to know. And, and, and the first one is, you know what? Problems are inevitable. It, it's not if they will come. It's simply when they will come. If people are applying for a job or somebody's putting out there, they, they, they're advertising for a job, oftentimes they'll say things, we want a problem solver. Or somebody submits a resume. I am a problem solver. Both sides there are anticipating that there's going to be problems. So let me be a prophet today and tell you something. You're going to have problems. You're going to have problems. Yeah. That's sad, ain't it? But you probably already knew that. You're going to have problems. The Christian who expect his, expects his or her walk with Christ to be easy is in for some bitter disappointment. Because, you know, even Jesus told us, John 16, in this world you will have trouble. There, right from Jesus' mouth. You're going to have trouble. I don't care who we are, how godly we are, we count on problems. No one is immune from those. Wow. Preacher, you just get sadder and sadder. Yeah, we're going to have them. Well, you know what? They're also going to be unpredictable. Um, James goes on to say in, in, in uh, James 1, 2, whenever you face trials... You know, the word face here, the the Greek word literally means to fall into unexpectedly. It's the same word that's actually used in the story of the Good Samaritan where where the guy fell among thieves. It was suddenly, unexpected. Trials aren't planned. You know, we we seldom can uh, anticipate problems we're going to experience. Usually, we can't anticipate them. We don't know they're coming. If we knew the problems that we were going to have, we'd probably do something different. We wouldn't go down that road. And you know what? Here's the thing we're going to get to in a minute, is your problems can benefit you if you learn from your problems. That's the important thing. Not doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. We can learn from our problems. We don't plan to have a flat tire. We don't plan to get sick or get laid off from work. And, you know, people go on a honeymoon, they don't plan on a divorce. Problems come when we least expect them. And for some people, when problems come, their lives are absolutely destroyed. You might have met people like that where problems come, they don't know what to do. And and maybe it was because growing up they were protected from problems so much that they never learned how to deal with a problem or an issue or a trial. Or maybe they watched mom and dad dealing with it and it wasn't the best way to deal with a problem or an issue. So problems are going to come. They're going to be unpredictable. And they're also, they're going to have many forms. They come in all shapes and sizes. The word here in Greek for many kinds literally means multicolored. Multicolored. Let me tell you about multicolored. I am helping this lady that I'm married to match some wall paint. I'm not a trained professional on that. I'm not a trained painter. I'm definitely not a woman. Because to a guy, white is white. But you go to buy white, 
And the guy at Home Depot says, well, what color white do you want? I want white. <laughs> what do you mean white? He said, we got bright white, off-white, ivory, eggshell, seashell, vanilla bean, winter white, warm white, French white, Nordic white, summer white, milky white, and foam white. Foam <laughs> white. You know, it's kind of one of those unexpected problems that you have. But there's scientific proof that men and women look at colors differently. I don't know what color fuchsia is. I don't care. It's probably one of those purple ones, isn't it? No, it's one of those pink ones. You don't know how true this is. And then you get the wrong white. Now I've got to repaint the whole wall. Yeah, small problems. But James wants us to realize that problems come in many shades, many varieties. Problems vary in intensity and in assortment, vary in duration. Some are minor, some are major, but they're all to be expected. Problems are also purposeful. They can be. Problems, they, they can be beneficial to our spiritual growth. Pain can be productive. Suffering can actually accomplish something if it has value in our lives. We can, we can learn from our problems. They can be beneficial. You know, sometimes smaller problems that we have that we learn from can prevent us from having those major problems later on. If we learn from them, if we learn from them, there are several purposes, I think, of problems in our lives. Uh, first is, is problems purify our faith. James uses the word testing, as in testing or refining gold and silver. And, and oftentimes we use attendance, worship attendance, as a benchmark of one's faithfulness. You know, are they a faithful person? Oh, yeah, they're in church every Sunday. Sunday night, Wednesday night, anytime else, they are faithful. Huh, is that the best test, though? Being in church, being in the assembly. I tell you, here, here's what I think. Faith, faith is purified on the battle lines. Our faith is tested in the emergency room. Our faith is tested in the funeral home. Our faith is tested in the unemployment line. Maybe much more so than being here and being a faithful member. Not to say you shouldn't, you should be. But where are you really tested? And that's life. That's life. While, while, and I mentioned this before, while in Iraq, uh, when I was there in 06, 07, the, the, um, sometimes there's the old saying that uh, there are no atheists in foxholes. Well, that's wrong because I saw in the middle of all the turmoil and bloodshed that uh, some people would lose their faith. There must not be a God to allow this going on. Their faith was being tested, and they lost their faith. Problems, for sure, fortify our patience. They fortify our patience. This is probably one of the reasons people don't like praying for patience, because they figure, if I do, God's going to send me something to build my patience. I don't want that. James 1 verse 3, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. He's talking about staying power, not a passive type patience, but endurance. The ability to hang in there, no matter what, you're still going to keep your faith, no matter what happens. God uses problems in our lives to teach us how to handle life's pressure. Problems also build our character. James goes on to say, let perseverance finish its work 
so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Problems help us to actually be more like Christ. Did Christ ever experience problems while he was here on earth? Absolutely he did. Absolutely. God's ultimate purpose is is maturity for us as we grow in Christ. The Bible never tells us we won't have any problems, but how to deal with those issues and problems. God, God, God wants us to grow up. God's number one purpose in our life is to make us like Jesus. Wow. So you say, well, 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 well preacher, then what do we do? How, how do we handle all our problems? Because we're going to have problems. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you what James said, you know, uh, have joy. Rejoice, pure joy. <sighs> Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials. Now, there are some verses in the Bible I like more than others. <laughs> maybe it's not that I don't like this one. It's maybe I don't understand it as much. Having joy when we face trials. When's the last time you threw a party at the emergency room and the trauma team is working on one of your family members? Through a party when a loved one was told they had terminal cancer, did you burst into joyful laughter? Not hardly. James here doesn't mean that we rejoice for the problem. We rejoice in the problem. I don't care where our problems come from. Our problems we might have brought on ourselves, maybe from others. Maybe a problem that society has brought on us. The source of them doesn't really matter. God can use them all for our growth and for His glory, no matter what. Church, I encourage us to pray for wisdom and understanding uh, for the problem. To grow from the problem, to make the choices that God wants us to make. Uh, we, we need to turn our issues and our problems over to God. We ask for wisdom to deal with it. And then we need to trust God. Probably some of the harder things there. You know, we rejoice in the problem. I mean, we, we, we consider it pure joy when we face trials. We pray about it. We ask God for wisdom. And then we turn it over to God to take care of it. Can you do that? Not always the easiest things to do. Sometimes when I think about some of the heartache and pain that many of my brothers and sisters here have gone through, many in this very church right here, it kind of breaks my heart. So many have maintained such a sweet spirit in the odds of incredible pressure, incredible problems and issue. Things that maybe people did to you or said to your situations or tragedy or illness, no matter what. Church, it's not always easy to have a joyful heart in the middle of problems. But so many of you have gone through so many issues and you're still here loving and serving Almighty God. You never quit. And church, let me tell you, because you've never quit, there's a promise that God makes to us later on in James chapter 1, looking down to verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So church, let me finish this morning by telling you this. You're going to have problems. Issues are going to come. James tells us in a very practical way, you're going to have issues in this life. You're going to have problems. There's going to be things that you have no control over, some that you might have some control over, but you're still going to have them. But he says, you know, consider it pure joy. You know, 
when these things come along, especially, I mean, if you're persecuted for, 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 for Christ even. But nevertheless, trust Him. Turn it over to God. I know that's easier said than done in a lot of cases. Trust Him. God's still in the same place He's always been. He's still there to provide for us, to take care of us every step of the way. But let me finish with this. You might have problems or issues going on in your life, maybe from things years ago, maybe from recent things, no matter what it is. But God also gives us one another to lean upon, to help bear those burdens. I'm telling you right now, as I tell you every week, to our guests and to our members, you have my phone number. If you ever want to call, if you ever want to talk, if you ever want to come into the office, if there's things you need to talk about, that's okay. I'm here for you. I promise you that. Our elders are as well. I promise you that. If there's something we can do for you, if you need help, if you have issues, no matter what they are, no matter what they are, what I say, no matter what they are, you might say, well, you know, Gary, I got stuff you probably never heard of before. I probably have. <laughs> Every time I say that, then somebody does bring something. I'm like, wow, I've never heard that before. church.